You're listening to That's Pretty Dark. The podcast where we talk about all of the entertainment that scared us as children. And still haunts us as adults. So grab your flashlight and join us as we take a frightfully nostalgic look over our shoulders. And under our beds. And in our closets. And together we'll realize, whoa, that's pretty that's dark. Pretty dark. I feel like I'm like an Alabama seven, you know, but anywhere else I'd be like a four, you know? No, I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> you don't think so? No, I think you're like an Alabama seven, but you're an everywhere else predominantly like 10. Oh, because I'm, I have tattoos and piercings. Not even that. I just think that like the Alabama 10 is like your Not me. good home cooking blonde girl who that also went to yeah. a big university and sorority. loves to go to football games. Mm-hmm. She's in a sorority. No offense to these people. She Those likes are to the woo. Alabama 10s. You're not wrong. She likes to woo. <laughs> woo. A woo girl. I like to woo. It depends on where we're wooing. I've wooed on the podcast. <laughs> I, I think woo. I have too. I woo so many people. Oh my God. But speaking of people's comments, you were just telling me oh, about- Oh, this is a segue. <laughs> I didn't think this was going to live on the podcast. You never know. I guess We give true. it the option by segue. I sat here. It was on my to-do list to respond to the emails. We had a lot of emails recently. We have. Thank you, by the way, everyone, yeah. for those emails. Although it took me all afternoon to respond to everybody- I just want to say that we have incredible listeners. We do. We have some of the We've best feedback. Some of the, we knew this. Yeah. I mean, we were, I guess we already knew but that. But we're also just glad to like connect and interact. So it kind of made my day. And it made me appreciate the fact that you run the social media and you take care of all that stuff so that I, I don't try. have to. Because it took me all afternoon to respond to <laughs> emails. But uh, I just want to give you a round of applause, Kaylin, because... Oh, oh my God. Thank you. You handle it with such, you know, finesse. Wow. And mystique. I don't know about that. And... Reverence. Reverence. Mm-hmm. Interesting adjective. <laughs> I'll take it, Just though. Just got to build that brand. So make sure you're following us. All that to say. <laughs> yeah. Or if you want to talk to Christian, who doesn't really get on the socials, shoot us an email. Yeah, you can do that. Well, like we said, my name's Christian. Oh, my name's Kaylin. And you're Kaylin. This is That's Pretty Dark. And today, we're covering something that we've been talking about doing for a long time. Yeah, it comes up very often, doesn't it? I think we've mentioned it on the podcast ever since we did All Dogs. Yes. uh, Because they're so similar. They are very, very similar. I know that ever since we started to do this, we were like, you know what we need to cover one day? Oliver and company. Oliver and company. And thank God you're doing it (laughs) because it sounds like a lot of research. It has been. You spent the entire weekend working on it. I spent so many hours, y'all, on this. Like, and it's great. I love this movie. I grew up with this movie. One of my very, very favorites. Me too. Thank God the music is very uh, uplifting. (laughs) Definitely some mood boosters in this, which I needed. How did anybody make it past the first five minutes of this movie? The music's so good. You just want to keep listening to it over and over. But like, it's so sad. Like, I began it today. I'll say that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're going to get more into it, but I watched it today um, in preparation for this. Yes. As soon as I saw the box of kittens. I mean, it's it's over. It's done. I was like, I don't know that I'm ready for this today. If you're not mentally prepared for it, it'll definitely uh, hit you real hard. I didn't feel ready. I still don't know if I am. I don't either. But thankfully, we're never really alone and we're doing this together. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. So starting us out, I wanted to talk about how... We will be dipping our toe today into Disney's 80s catalog for the first time. We've talked about a couple of different 80s films, Labyrinth and Goonies specifically. Right. But this is the first time that we're going into the 80s with- Disney. The Walt Disney. Interesting. Side of life. I didn't realize that. That's true. The 80s are considered Disney's animation dark ages for good reason. Not only because several of these releases kind of failed to perform at the box office, but because many of these titles are literally dark in nature. Is that also a fun reference to just history, how the Dark Ages came before the Renaissance? Yes, it is. <laughs> it works yes. out so well. I don't know that it was coined the Dark Ages until we had the Renaissance happen as well, the Disney Renaissance. Um, I do think that that phrase came after, that title came after. Man, uh, I'm just picking, I'm just, you know. Picking up on it. <laughs> I'm just picking up on it. Figuring it out. <laughs> I'm here for a reason. <laughs> So to list off some of those 80s titles, we began with The Fox and the Hound, Mm -hmm. The Black Cauldron, The Great Mouse Detective, another one of my very favorites. Those preceded Oliver, and it was followed the next year by The Little Mermaid, which we know is credited as sparking the Disney Renaissance, like you said. Damn. 
We will eventually cover all of those classics and get to the why of all of this darkness in the 80s for Disney. I cannot wait. Because that's exactly what we're here in your ears to do. Mm -hmm. Today, I can go ahead and tell you that one of the reasons for this dark content was the shift in personnel at the Walt Disney Animation Studio. Really? The original central brain trust of Disney animators that we've spoken about before, we talked about them during Pinocchio, mm -hmm. the nine old men had mostly retired by the 80s. Oh, okay. In fact, the very last holdout of the nine old men was Eric Larson, who retired in 1986. So they were really on their way out and gone by the time Oliver and Company began production. Wow. And this gave rise to a whole new generation of Disney animators. These were kids in their 20s and 30s, some of whom had been mentored by the nine old men. And these were animators who had grown up in the 60s and 70s, otherwise known as the heyday of crime dramas, yeah. as they were gaining their sea legs themselves before ushering in the Disney Renaissance. Interesting. Okay. Plus, there were some new cats in charge. Yes, that's a pun. <laughs> and we're going to talk about them soon, too. Some new cool cats. <laughs> That makes sense. Shift in personnel. People are dying off. Well, sounds like dark times. Some are dying off. Yes. Um, some are just retiring. But I mean, What's some the of the difference? nine old men had passed in the 70s, honestly. Yeah. It's kind of that that also adds to the darkness of the studio. And there are other reasons for that. So, yeah. Well, I mean, having lived with that beauty and magic for decades to all of a sudden be like, hmm, all the like golden age aspects of our company are kind of dying off. That's got to that's got to be really tricky for the minds of those creatives who were involved, yeah. actively involved in those projects. And it makes a lot of sense when you look at it this way, that in the history of the company, they were just at a point of what do we do next? Like, where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. All of the classics of the, you know, the Pinocchio age, the Snow White age into right. the 50s and 60s, uh, Jungle Book, you know, and then we kind of get to the 80s and everything sort of grinds to a halt because everybody's new. Yeah. It's all new faces. Just continuing with the uh, analogy of the Dark Ages and the Renaissance and like how before that, mm -hmm. uh, just ancient Rome and how it was on top of the world and ruled everything. And then it fell, Dark Ages. Mm -hmm. And then there's the Renaissance eventually in Rome. Great dynasties always fall. Unfortunately, um, huh. nothing lasts forever. That almost <laughs> rings a little bit too true. Yeah, it's a little too close to home for right now. current political climate. Yep. So... Would you like a summary? Hit me with that summary. Oliver and Company is the G-rated, but definitely could have been PG, mm. story of an orphan kitten on the streets of 1980s New York City. It chronicles his fated meeting with street smart and spirited Dodger, a Jack Russell Terrier, and his merry gang of mutts, and the, we'll call it resourceful measures they take to help their human Fagin, mm. who is a con man who has written one too many checks that he can't cash to Lone Shark and implied crime boss, Sykes. Psych? Psych. <laughs> And do those names sound familiar? They should. They should. Why should they sound familiar to the listener, Christian? Go ahead and tell us. Well, I don't know if you've heard of it. So it's based off of an old classic novel. That's right. Oliver Twist, written by a little known author named Charlie D. Yeah. Charles Dickens. We, we know him as Charlie D, but <laughs> uh, the layman might know him as Charles Dickens. <laughs> the layman. <laughs> Yeah, it's based off of Oliver Twist. Oliver Twist. And that's really one of the first things that I want to hit you guys with today. Most of you probably know that from your community theater For productions sure. that put on a version of Oliver Twist. I was going to say, stage. if it wasn't on your elementary school reading list or summer reading at your, some point, yes. it was definitely performed in your uh, local theater. <laughs> the version we had to read in school was this like abridged, rewritten for kids version of Oliver Twist. I think me too. How, I still have it actually. Wow. In my uh, childhood bookshelf that's in my house now. Wow. Yeah, that's weird. Times don't change that much. Nope. And that's exactly what I'm about to discuss. I also want to point out, <laughs> and you may or may not care about this listener, but Charles Dickens adaptations actually mean a lot to Christian and I. Mm -hmm. The feature film that we made together was actually an adaptation of A Christmas Carol. Yeah, it was. It has always fascinated the two of us how these same themes and ideas can apply so many years removed. Right. For better or for worse, humans never really change that much. Mm -mm. He's great because he's timeless. He is. Dickens. Timeless he, he, is the word. He looked into the human soul and wrote about human nature, not and about- And he wrote about human nature honestly. Honestly, in a way that humans have always acted and will always act. He just wrote them into his time period. Mm-hmm. But they still apply today. The Absolutely. same stories still apply. They're applicable across the board for every generation. Yes. From the generation that we were growing up uh, watching this film yeah. um, to even now, 35 years 
after Oliver and Company was released. Especially because like you watch it when you're a kid and you're like, oh yeah, you got me- you got mixed up with the wrong guy. Now you owe him some money. We understood that mm-hmm. as kids. But then you get older yep. and you begin to identify with Fagin <laughs> yeah. uh, from this kid's cartoon. And you're like, <laughs> I hate owing money mm-hmm. to like the bank or whoever, mm-hmm. you know, I got a loan from. Man. Uh, like you own a house. Well, guess what? You don't own your house. The bank does. Yeah, the bank owns the house. You're paying the bank. To live here. For sure. Yeah, you can't get behind on your payments. And Fagin just learned that the hard way. He did. And we have some more darkness that lives in there that we're going to unpack. But suffice it to say that Sykes is not a nice man. And he may not even be operating legally on all fronts. You telling me Uh, that a money-focused person (laughs) might be tempted to do some bad things? Yeah, I'm telling you that this guy that just loans money to people might not be doing it. Uh, above the table entirely. You learn something new every day. You do. But it's more than just that, though. (laughs) It's always more. I think that there are so many interesting points that we can make, not only on the climate when this film was released in the 80s, but the message that it was reviving from a society that was over 100 years prior to that. Yeah, right. That was functional 100 years prior to that, and how all of it is still relevant and important commentary nearly 35 years from the film being released, even. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to admit something. (laughs) vulnerable to you and to the listener. Oh, confession time. We love confession time. Confession time. When I was a child myself, the Oliver Twist adaptation aspect was 100% lost on me. Oh, well, yeah. I had no, nothing. Of course. Right over my head completely. Even though I did, you know, read maybe an abridged version of Oliver Twist or I was familiar with the story. But you probably watched this way before you ever had to read that for school. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. I was much younger I when mean, I watched this. I feel like that. But would even come. when I read it in school, it did not connect the dots for me because I was yeah. still watching it. I watched this movie. <laughs> I watched this movie so many times throughout my life right. from the age of five onward. Yeah. It lived in its own way in your mind. I, it was already separate. It was. Yeah. It was already separated in my head. And I don't you can think- also say loosely based off of Oliver Twist. <laughs> sure. Yes. Uh, but I don't think that It clicked for me that it was called Oliver and Company because it was based on Oliver Twist, like the obvious connection. Right. I don't think that that clicked for me until I was in high school. Yeah. Those are the kind of uh, conclusions we drew in high school when we all began having these conversations. Like, Mm -hmm. do you remember watching all these things when we were kids? Mm -hmm. Did you watch Oliver and Company? Did you guys realize that's based off of Oliver Oliver Twist? Twist. Yeah, we talked about that Those are the things that you figure out as you all begin talking about it. For sure. Because when you're a little kid, you know, you don't have that same the social aspect of commentary, you know, you're just kind of existing in a silo with your little family watching your VHS tape. Mm -hmm. And the older that you get, the more you realize that these experiences are shared, which is just crazy to think about. Right. I think about it pretty often now though, this, this film and its connections to the time of Dickens. And I also think about it every time I watch that one episode of Gilmore Girls where Rory calls Jess Dodger. And then he's like, what? And she says, figure it out. And he says, Oliver Twist. (laughs) I, and then I swoon. don't actively remember that, but I'll take your word for it. It definitely happened. I've rewound that part a few times. I have been thinking about um, Gilmore Girls recently because we began around this time last year watching I was art. going to text you the other day yeah. and be like, I, you know what I miss so much? <laughs> watching Gilmore, <laughs> watching Girls. Gilmore Girls. Just that was sitting down on the couch, turn on the Gilmore Girls, I think texting about you the through the episode. Me too. That's one of my favorite TV watching experiences. I know that I sure. won't be able to watch it again. Without you watching at the same time. Oh, yeah. It's just a shared like, experience I couldn't now. just put it on. Like, I'd have to be like, hey, do you want to watch Gilmore Girls? <laughs> is what I would do. <laughs> I'm really rarely ever going to say no to that. It's one of my comfort shows. Maybe we'll do it. Who knows? So with all this conversation on Oliver Twist, let's just go ahead and refresh our memories on the novel and the concept as a whole, because it has been a really long time since uh, Lit Class. Same. So in the Dickens novel, A Hard Knock Orphan Oliver in 19th century London, is fleeing the cruelty of the workhouse and is forced to join a band of young thieves and pickpockets Mm -hmm. headed by the notorious Fagin and the evil Bill Sykes just to survive. Yeah, buddy. Ultimately, he must summon the courage to fight for his freedom and future and avoid being hardened by his circumstances. As stated by Wikipedia of the novel, Oliver Twist unromantically portrays the sordid lives of criminals and exposes the cruel treatment of the many orphans in London in the mid-19th century. Mm Mm-hmm. Dickens' entire message satirized child labor, domestic violence, the recruitment of children as criminals, which was rampant at the time. Absolutely was. And the general presence of street children, essentially exploring the social implications of a world in which mere children are pickpocketing, inciting violence, and becoming prematurely world-weary at the hands of power-hungry individuals. Adults who prey on children. 
You might even say? Common theme we run into around these parts because that's pretty dark. It's almost like that's been around forever. (laughs) I didn't actually know this, but it's said that the novel may have been inspired by the story of Robert Blinko, who was an orphan whose account of working in a cotton mill as a child was widely read and distributed in the 1830s. Oh, interesting. And it's likely that Dickens' own childhood experiences contributed to this as well because he spent two years himself in the workhouse at the age of 12. I was going to say. And missed out on some of his education because of this. Yeah. That's why he writes so much about the workhouses. I mean, Mm -hmm. we know this from A Christmas Carol. Yes. And a lot of his stories have to do with kids escaping it or being threatened with having to be sent to a workhouse Mm -hmm. or that kind of thing. It's it's just, it epitomizes hell. Like it is Mm -hmm. hell on earth in Dickens' mind. And he because he had this experience at 12 years old. You don't want to work there. You don't want to go there. Yeah. And he wanted to avoid it for the rest of his life. And I'm going to go ahead and disclaim that I don't mean to imply at any point today with any of the things that I'm saying that these are issues that we've resolved in the modern world because no. we're very far from it. Hmm. We know that gang violence is still a huge issue, especially here in America, where many children are forced into that lifestyle. Yep. And we know that while child labor laws may have improved the situation in a lot of the United States, we are still confronted by child labor issues all across the world. Wasn't there just a new bill passed recently? With the GOP. I think so. They changed the child labor law so that kids can Mm -hmm. work. Longer hours Longer hours or something. I think something was amended recently. Yeah. I don't want to speak to it and not know. That picture is haunting. It is. Of them like signing it. Because we've made so much progress getting away from that. All the adults are smiling and the kids look terrified. I've seen it too. Yeah. That's a haunting image. It's just, it's just awful. It's awful. Yeah. Kids don't need to work. It's unreal. I know. And we still have the systemic mistreatment of orphans. Yep. And I can't even go into the mistreatment systemically of disabled children and adults. Right. There's just so much that we are still working on. So I don't mean to imply that we have solved anything, but- Being 35 years beyond even when this film was released, I do think that we can at least be glad that a reasonable majority of children watching the film at its release and children watching today probably don't see as much of themselves in the story as they would have in Dickens' time. That's probably true. I still think that it's really cool that Disney would tackle a social issue like this in the 80s Mm -hmm. in whatever capacity that they did it because, as we often say, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. Yeah. Education is our greatest and most important weapon. Read books. Scream it from the rooftops. (laughs) Read books. Read about history. Learn about history. Whatever they're telling you not to read. Whatever they're telling your kids not to read. You go read it. Go figure out why. I'm going to start doing this from now on. I don't know if I'm going to (laughs) begin the episodes or end the episodes, but I'm going to give people their bi-weekly or semi-weekly reminder. To go read books. That to remove any amount of education or to censor books or to... Whatever is fascism, Mm -hmm. and it leads to terrible, terrible things. Book banning, book burning is fascism. We have to know this information. We have to have access to it. Our kids have to have access to it. We have to think for ourselves. If you look at the list of books that are being banned, some of them, several, many of them are about just inclusivity Mm -hmm. and including others and emotional intelligence and emotional capacity and awareness of emotions of your own and others, things that they really weren't teaching us on that level as kids that they're now teaching Gen Alpha. Yep. Just go look at a list. Just it's horrible. Go look. So despite the specific 19th, to get right back on track. Let's get back into it because I'm about to get pissed. <laughs> <laughs> despite the specific 19th century connections going right over my head as a kid, it's kind of the point that I and my fellow millennials, thats me over 100 years after Dickens was talking about these things, were still all too familiar with the necessity of street smarts and the nefarious nature of the villains and even the understanding that sometimes we might be required to do the wrong things for the right reasons. Mm. Interesting take on stranger danger. Hey, there are many, many avenues we need to pursue (laughs) about stranger danger in this film. (laughs) So many, I know. This film was marketed as a more heartwarming take on Oliver Twist, but when we really step back and consider the subject matter, it shouldn't surprise us that it was also one of the darkest children's films to date. Taking for granted the average 20th century child's understanding of mob debts, shady dockside rendezvous, yep. and ransom exchanges. Oof. And don't get me started on the fiery train crash. Not yet. <laughs> and the kidnapping. And the kidnapping. My God. This film pulled no punches for the sake of the young audience and instead fully exposed the underside of New York in the late 1980s. And I think at least some part of Dickens would be proud of that. No, I think so. 
I think so. I think he would have a lot to write about New York from that time period. Mm -hmm. The 70s, the 80s, with all the mob crimes and all the danger. Yes. Like Crime how, was like out of control. New York was its most dangerous mm -hmm. through that period. I mean, maybe not 100 or 200 years before. Like early New York, I think, was pretty dangerous. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> colonial New York. Colonial New York um, was probably also probably a pretty, pretty terrifying shady. place if you weren't in the right <laughs> station of life. Right. But of the modern age, of these modern times... In the modern America, I think that the 70s and the 80s, New York was not a place mm -hmm. you wanted to just go walking down the street. I've watched several documentaries yeah. about that like, fear the city origins of Doc. Fear City. That's oh, one of them, yeah. Incredible. It's wild. But, uh, I think Dickens would be pretty pleased. I think he'd be happy with it. Mm -hmm. He would go, thank you, thank you. God, somebody gets it. Somebody gets it and somebody's applying it for the modern world. Thank the heavens for <laughs> modern man. I was about to say. Yes. I have no idea what Dickens sounded like. I don't know. I just, I, I do wonder sometimes what he would think. And I think in this specific instance, he would be okay. Bring me another chocolate bar. <laughs> Sounds more like Willy Wonka. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think that the parallels drawn about morality and right versus wrong in varying circumstances and that the desire we all feel to protect those we love were enough to make this fit for a Disney imagining and make it stick in our hearts and minds. Hmm. Not to mention, I was an animal kid. We've talked about this before at length. <laughs> yeah. And therefore, I watched this tape hundreds and hundreds of times. And I, I really believe that I became sentient. Like, it happened to me during a yeah. period where I was watching this movie and All Dogs and Fern Gully just back to back to back to back. I think right. that's when my awareness began. I watched this so many times, too. Way more than All Dogs. Um, although, in my mind, they were like the same movie mm -hmm. for a long period of time. I couldn't really differentiate. With good reason. I mean, yeah. There are lots of parallels there. Disney's 27th feature animation, Oliver and Company, hit the theaters on November 18th, 1988. 27, huh? It was released on the same day as another dark favorite, Don Blue's The Land Before Time. Oh my God. Which I knew, but what I didn't realize is that the date was chosen because it was also 60 years to the day from the original release of Steamboat Willie, huh. which is often considered Mickey Mouse's birthday. Wow. How about that? Mm -hmm. And Don Bluth was just like... Here are my dinosaurs. You're welcome. <laughs> Here, cry about my dinosaurs before you cry <laughs> about their cats. Yeah, I don't know, man. Mm -hmm. They're both so good in different ways. I feel like if I had to pick one, I would just that's not rough. know what to do. Yeah, that's really hard. This is actually the fourth Disney animated film set in the time of its first release. Hmm. The first being Dumbo, 101 Dalmatians, and The Rescuers. I didn't really think about this until watching again this time, how dated it is for the 80s. There are so many markers that show you we're in the 1980s, the boom boxes, the fashion choices. Right. Which makes it to me very reminiscent of 101 Dalmatians because that also is very obviously in its time. I haven't fashion. seen that one since I was a kid either, so I don't oh, know. man. I just always notice the uh, Twin Towers. Yes. In all these old movies, I'm like, the first thing you see, if it's New York, you see the mm -hmm. Empire State Building and you see the, the Twin, Twin Towers. towers. Did you know that in a lot of films, even a lot of Disney films, they actually remove moments of the, the Twin Towers? No. They did in the, the years following the terrorist attacks. They removed those types of shots from several films. This was mm. one of the very few that it stayed in. No, I didn't know that. They, out of reverence, I guess. But yeah. I guess so. It took two and a half years of production, six supervising animators, and a team of over 300 artists and technicians to bring the film to life in over a million story sketches what? and 120,000 animation cells. Whoa. These are their stories. <laughs> <laughs> it seems huge. Yeah, that's a lot of people. Oliver and Company was the first feature film to begin its production under the watchful eye of what would become two very familiar names to the Disney legacy, Michael Eisner and Jeffrey Katzenberg, who yeah, would both okay. come over from Paramount in 1984 during a major restructuring. We'll be able to dive deeper into their careers during another movie night, I'm sure, because we've already spoken about Jeffrey Katzenberg and his very uh, competitive dealings <laughs> in the animation world during several of our yeah. episodes in our catalog. Paramount transition. Paramount indeed. From one studio to the next. But you might be surprised to learn what I learned through a Yahoo article and an interview with beloved animator Glenn Keane, which I love him. It was written by Gwen Watkins, and I would like to quote what Glenn said because I think he describes it pretty well and he lived it. You know, he was right there. Because during this time period, the future of Disney's animation division was actually hanging on by a thread. Mm. Glenn said, 
I remember that was a turning point in Disney history because there was a question whether animation would continue or not. Really? They had inherited this animation department and it's expensive to run. So they were asking, do we need to keep doing animated movies? We don't know. We were moved off the Disney lot into some warehouses in Glendale. The old building that Walt had built was no longer ours. And there was a question that maybe we won't continue with animation anymore. You knew it was true because everyone carried their belongings out in cardboard boxes to their little warehouse. (laughs) And the first movie we were working on was Oliver and Company. Yeah, He said, but what happened right at that time was there was this film called An American Tale that came out. Hmm. And it wasn't Disney, it was Don Bluth. And it made more money than any non-Disney animated film in history had at that point. And Glenn said, I think that triggered a competitive spirit in Jeffrey, that somebody was beating us at our own game, and we should be the ones out front. Hey. We know this about Jeffrey. We've seen it in our other episodes. Right. He was determined to compete, Glenn said, so he threw himself into the making of Oliver and Company. He said Jeffrey Katzenberg would sit in on their meetings, and he was amazed. He was like, okay, this big shot studio executive is going to come in here, and he's going to tell us what to do and how this is going to work. Hmm. But then he was amazed at Jeff's creative ideas. He said that Jeff acted like an animator. And he was wonderful in that Jeffrey Katzenberg abrasive way. And he said he really liked the energy that Jeff Katzenberg ended up bringing to the film. Hmm. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. They were all kind of like, well, what are we doing here? Like, Competition is good. It is, I think, in a lot of ways. We need competition. We don't need one company running everything and diminishing the quality of every single product that we can consume Mm -hmm. in this consumerist economy. No, competition is important. Fight. For your right. Oh my God, to party. party. (laughs) That's where I'm at today. That's where I'm at right now, too. I'm so tired. (laughs) I'm working on it, though. We're here. I'm so tired. I'm sorry. Buzz is yelling. I'm so tired, but I am. And I'm here. It'll be okay. I'll be more awake for part two. (laughs) With the future of the studio hanging in the balance and during production for The Great Mouse Detective, Eisner and Katzenberg invited animators to pitch ideas for upcoming features. It was then that John Musker pitched The Little Mermaid, Hmm. the film that would officially launched the Disney Renaissance by most accounts, but they didn't know that yet. Right. And Pete Young, animator and writer for Disney throughout the 70s and 80s, who had also pitched The Great Mouse Detective, pitched Oliver and Company. Okay. He literally just pitched Oliver Twist, but with dogs. (laughs) (laughs) Jeff Katzenberg jumped on this opportunity, though, because he had already wanted to do a live-action adaptation of the popular musical Oliver when he was at Paramount. Yeah. So he was all about this. He was already in it, yeah. Okay. Wasn't a hard sell. And that sounds like the Dark Ages, too, like before a a renaissance of like, Mm -hmm. they're all packing up. They're all like, are we even going to keep doing this? What are we going to do? How are we going to make this work? Maybe the world's going to end. Yeah. Is this even worth it anymore? Yeah. Man. And then you choose the beauty, you choose to create, you choose to move forward with life. You choose life. You choose art. You choose art. For sure. It's almost like the two are synonymous and then art is just so important life and to art. life. Art and life. Stop banning all the books. <laughs> Stop taking them away from our children. The film was directed by George Scribner, a new addition to Disney from Hanna-Barbera. Wow. And this was his first feature. I'm into it. It was supposed to be co-directed by Pete Young, the guy who had made the pitch, But he passed away very suddenly in October 1985 from complications of the flu at only 37 years old. Wow. Really awful. He was going to co-direct it. so young. Yeah. And he never got to see it complete. And he'd also pitched Great Mouse Detective. And both of those were released after he had passed. Hmm. It's crazy. That is wild. He actually contributed to the story of all of Disney's releases in the 80s other than The Little Mermaid. Hmm. Like I said, this was George's first feature. He was listed as an animator on The Black Cauldron. Um, Mm. And he's also uncredited, listed as a director for Mickey's Philhar Magic, which is the attraction in Magic Kingdom. Wow. So that's pretty fun. I love the Philhar Magic. (laughs) Me too. It's one of my favorites. I always do it. And I know I I cannot wait to cover the Black Cauldron. Mm. Yeah. We get messages about that one pretty frequently. It's so dark. It's very, very dark. So dark. I think that one was actually the first Disney film to get a PG rating. Really? Not just G. Mm -hmm. Wow. Makes sense. I love the 80s. So dark. So, <laughs> so dark. dark and spooky. There's so All much darkness the time. there. I know. I love it. Richard Rich, who had previously co-directed The Fox and the Hound and The Black Cauldron, was brought Richard in to Rich? replace- mm-hmm. Richard Rich. Richie did Rich. Did he inspire Richie Rich? <laughs> not that I know of. Not that I read. But How yeah, did he his not? Name's Richard Rich. <laughs> <laughs> How did he not? Another Macaulay Culkin classic. Apparently, he was not the nicest guy in the accounts that I read, though, because um, like I said, he was brought in to replace- Peter Young, Mm. but he was fired for acting belligerent, in quotes, that was all I saw, Mm. to the president of Walt Disney Feature Animation. 
and he wasn't replaced after being fired, which left George Scribner as the sole director. Wild. And I feel like there's always some drama <laughs> with the directors. There seems to um, always this be. Past yeah. several things that we've talked about, yeah. I feel like. Well, because there's always like three or four world. directors. Exactly. There's, there's so always many people. So many. There's too many. Well, what was the joke? Too many directors too many in the, in the kitchen. directors in the something. kitchen, yeah. <laughs> I forget. I also think knowing that this was the climate at the studio at the time is another reason why darkness kind of permeated the films in the 80s because yeah. there was so much tension in the air. And that just like in the studio. tempted people to take out their frustrations through the animation and the storylines. Yeah. <laughs> life's hard. You know what? Life is hard. See, kids? Life's really hard. <laughs> I do tend to vent through my own stories as well, mm -hmm. so I guess that makes sense. It definitely makes sense to me. Like we said, art is life. That's where some of it comes out. Yeah. Disney was kind of avant-garde in some of their directing techniques for animation. Mm -hmm. uh, Scribner actually borrowed a technique from Lady and the Tramp, which came out in 1955, by blocking out the scenes on real streets and then photographing them with cameras mounted 18 inches off the ground so animators could use the photos as templates to provide a real dog's eye view of what was going on. That's really interesting. Yeah. Which wow. I feel like you can see that in the film. Yeah, sure. You can see that there's this there's this authentic quality to it, like what's happening at that level. Yeah. And it's because they had those reference images, I think. Because it does tend to play down toward the street level, yeah. The screenplay was written by none other than Jim Cox. Does that sound familiar? Emphasis on the Cox. Yeah, sure does. <laughs> well, he went on to write The Rescuers Down Under, but he also wrote something with uh, a very slimy, polluted... Villain, <laughs> you wouldn't be talking about Hexus now, would you? I would be. He wrote the screenplay for Fern Gully. Uh, additional writers credited are Tim Disney, who was a great nephew of Roy Disney, okay, and James Mangold. Do you know him? Mm -mm. He wrote and directed Girl Interrupted. All right. He directed Walk the Line, Three Ten to Yuma, Logan, several others, and was an EP on The Greatest Showman. Wow. So he was an additional writer on Oliver and Company. Big stuff. Listener, if you're a Disney nerd or you enjoy this film at all, I'm about to blow your mind with this next little piece of trivia that I found out. <laughs> there was a point in story development when they considered making the story a sequel to The Rescuers, giving the character of Penny more development, showing her living a new life in New York City with Georgette and her new adoptive parents. Jenny. That would have been... Penny. <laughs> so, but the original idea came from adapting Oliver Twist and... But, Correct. But with dogs? Correct. And then eventually and like, someone's like... Well, we could like, make this a, a sequel to wait The a Rescuers. Minute, but they're going to keep the Oliver Twist element? I think so. I never read any different. That's just like universe, like, a crossover. Mm -hmm. that is Lots a, of universe crossover. That's and wild. it got complicated and they ended up scrapping it, so obviously. They just removed that whole Because element. for one, it felt really far-fetched. Wow. For me, the issue would be more the timeline because The Rescuers was also kind of based in the time that it was set. Yeah. Which means Penny would have been at least 10 years older than any age that Jenny seems to be in this film. Yeah. And it also kind of would have robbed her of her happily ever after if her happily ever after was to be with new adoptive parents and then Jenny's parents are never there. Yeah. So instead, <laughs> we get a whole new character. I would need to rewatch that to fully understand what you're talking about. But it's pretty wild. The thought of it is pretty wild. But then I laugh because it's, oh, well, duh, it's it's Jenny, not Penny. Oh, yeah. And they don't look <laughs> dissimilar. I'm glad they didn't do that. I'm kind of glad, too. But as work continued on Oliver, Roy E. Disney, who was chairman of the animation department at the time and the son of Roy O. Disney, Walt's brother, <laughs> There were a lot of Disneys involved, and honestly less than you would think, but there were still a lot of Disneys at this time involved with the studio. Sure. But Roy E. Disney, who the animation building is named after now, mm -hmm. um, he pitched an idea that Fagin would attempt to steal a rare panda from the city zoo. But this subplot was eventually dropped when uh, Scribner suggested that Fagin instead hold Oliver Ransom. Gotcha. And at the time, they were considering that he would hold Oliver Ransom because he was a rare, valuable breed of cat. <laughs> yeah, I get it. That's not you're, exactly how it turned out. Finding but your your points, you know, your plot points. They found it eventually. <laughs> it may, it, yeah, it works how it is. They, they found the right one. Yeah, I think so too. But speaking of um, finding your plot points, yeah. according to the Be All End All Wikipedia, in a draft of the script from <laughs> March 30th, 1987, when it was still under the name Oliver and the Dodger, oh. the film's concept was even darker than the one that we see on screen. I live for this kind of stuff. Let's go. <laughs> In this version, the film began with Sykes' two Dobermans, Roscoe and DeSoto as we know them, 
murdering Oliver's parents, setting the story <laughs> to focus on Oliver seeking revenge. Oh my God, a revenge tale. That's pretty dark. <laughs> oh, yeah, so it was dumb. It was going to be Oliver's revenge on Roscoe and DeSoto, <laughs> which is wild. Uh, and I think, I think a little bit of that concept lingers in the film that we see when those dogs come out of nowhere at the very beginning, when Oliver's just by himself, that tiny little kitty on the streets of New York right. City in the rain. It's like- And those crazy, <laughs> crazed, terrifying dogs that I swear to you, I saw those dogs in my dreams. They were scary. It's kind of like, yeah. um, very similar to the dog that comes out of the book in Page Master. Yeah, that- Down to the Baskervilles is what it comes out of. Because it felt very, very demonic uh, compared to like an actual dog because it's like missing an eye and everything. Yes. It was like- like the dogs that we see that have personalities and, you know- yeah. They develop the characters of those guys seem safe enough. Even Roscoe and DeSoto to an They're extent. They're soulless, these, these dogs. These dogs seem, yeah, soulless They're like the wolves terrifying. from Beauty and the Beast. Like yes. they're just pure like the evil. And, the beast. and I think that that probably is a thread that carried through the animation too. That makes me um, laugh as a concept ugh. because I just see the tiny Oliver Kitten <sighs> um, living out this Batman this Bruce, <laughs> this Bruce Wayne yeah. slash The Crow, yeah. um, like movie plot Imagining line. Imagining Oliver looking down from the, like a skyscraper <laughs> yeah. at it's, the city it's, below. It's like, raining. It's my his, time now. His fur is all dripping and he's all like yeah. ominous looking and he like, he paints his <laughs> eyes and he f jumps off of the building and he, his claws come out. He flies. And he flies because he fluffs up. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It just, that would be uh, such a different movie. <laughs> it would be. It would be a very different uh, movie. And I think it would kind of undermine the original point that Dickens was making, which was <laughs> how much of your humanity or how much of your um, childhood, how much of your lightheartedness or gentleness can you retain uh, right. despite these terrible circumstances. So I think it kind of would have done the opposite. <laughs> I think he'd be very disappointed with uh, an adaptation more like that. I tend to think so. Yes. Yeah. And like you were saying at the very beginning of this episode, while my child self very easily understood the idea that Fagin owed a debt to Sykes, yeah. it always bothered me that we never knew like the exact reason or even an amount of money that was owed to Sykes. Yeah, totally vague. In an earlier version of the script, it's mentioned that he borrowed the money to bet in an illegal poker tournament, possibly helping to cover his living costs before he lost all of the money. Mm-hmm. And I think that that probably still holds true in the plot of the film that we see, um, despite yeah. not being explicitly stated. I'm going to watch it again before we do our part two. Sure. He does say something. Uh, Fagin has a line somewhere where he sort of hints at- The reason- Like something yeah. like, this is why you don't do this particular thing mm -hmm. because you would then owe the money back or something like that. I don't remember, but- I think that, yeah, he I think you're right. And that something. that lends itself to he lost it gambling, thinking, mm -hmm. oh, I'll make it back and then some. It was something like that, yeah. You're never going to. <laughs> no. If you do, it's not going to happen, it, you know, every time. It's going to be a one-time thing where you get lucky. I'm also uh, watching The Sopranos for the first time. Oh, yeah. Definitely don't want to get into a gambling situation with these mobsters and no. then owe one of them money. Never. Not something you want to do because then they don't, you don't just owe them money. They own you in as a human being. A lot of the material that I was reading, some people call Sykes a loan shark. Some people just call him a crime boss in general. But loan sharks are criminals for the most part at the end of the day because they're charging people insane amounts of interest on money that they need to survive. It's um, all pretty nefarious. Yeah. yeah, it's real shady. Yeah. It's very exploitative. Yes, yes it and is. And we see that in Oliver and Company very clearly. We see this depicted in fiction all the time because it's real. Yes. I mean, let's not forget that. Like, this is a cartoon. I'm referencing The Sopranos, which is fiction. It's not fictional. But all this exists because this stuff is is real life. And prevalent. Any one of us can get to a point where we need money, we borrow money, then we owe money, yep. and you got to pay it back. Every time. Got to. The piper must be paid. That's just part of being an adult, mm. and it's horrible. It's dark. Pretty dark. Like I was talking about with these kids that grew up in the 70s on these crime dramas, now they're animating kids' movies, and they're putting <laughs> all of this crime drama into kids' movies. This is why we've been talking so much about true crime lately, because yeah. it's factoring in more and more into the content, the, mm -hmm. the media the that we're talking that we, about. The closer that we are and the more that we live in that 80s, 90s headspace, the more that we see that in the media yep. trickling down from adult entertainment of the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Among the film's supervising animators were superstar Glenn Kane, like I had mentioned, 
Ruben A. Aquino, Mike Gabriel, Hindel Butoy, and Mark Hinn, many of whom, especially Glenn, are responsible for the Disney Renaissance. Wow. You can even see certain characters from previous Disney films make cameos and lend to the animation of the film, including Peg, Jacques, and Trusty from Lady and the Tramp. Okay. And you probably saw this one, Pongo from 101 Dalmatians. Oh, the Dalmatians. Straight up. Pongo with his red collar and everything is in one of the scenes. Yeah, there were a lot of familiar looking pieces of animation, not the least of which, which I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about, was We're Back. Yes. With... Not only just New York, but even the way that the humans were animated. That time frame, there were so, so many, even background animators and painters, some of them being uh, Rene Alcazar, Jim Coleman. A lot of them have credits for other non-Disney pretty dark films like right. An American Tale, Cats Don't Dance, Secret and Nim, Quest for Camelot. Gotcha. I didn't see We're Back on anybody's credit list, but it would not surprise me. Yeah. I didn't look at every single person. I mean, there were 300 people, you know, working on this thing. Even down to like just people's legs and their shoes mm -hmm. to me looked like we were back mm -hmm. very much so it's and wild. just the city the skyline yeah the city itself it's another reason why new york and that environment felt so familiar to me as a child even growing up in the american south right i didn't yeah. see new york in person until i was 12 years old but <laughs> i had an, a deep understanding of what the culture of the city was like going when i was like 11 i was like you know what <laughs> this looks exactly the way i thought it would yep it, and it does. It feels the same way. It really, it really it is the same. They capture that like New York spirit. New York has a spirit. Oh, it does. More than really anywhere else. More than most places, especially most places in the U.S. You can almost bottle it. You know exactly what it is. If you've ever been there or you've even seen media about New York, everybody wants to bottle that and capture that feeling. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about it when we get to the music. So keep Sweet. like a pin in that for sure. I got pins everywhere. <laughs> My pockets mostly. <laughs> So Sykes, <laughs> Jenny, Georgette, and Fagin were all characters animated by Glenn Keane. And if you know Disney or you know him as an animator, you can totally see his style specifically coming through in those characters. Yeah. And as a fun little Easter egg that Disney did, you can see a photo of Professor Radigan from The Great Mouse Detective in Georgette's photo album. I'm trying to even remember her photo album. Her photo collection, I should say. I guess that's it. All the suitors and such. Mm -hmm. And speaking of just the animation style. This was the first Disney film to feature extensive computer animation at 11 total minutes of runtime. Hmm. And this was the first to have a department created specifically for computer animation, with the two previous films having only used it for very limited sequences. They were kind of a test run, and so was this, honestly, at the end of the day, because they didn't want they didn't do an entire film in computer or using computer animation. They just kind of used it for certain sequences. Way back in the 80s too, huh? Mm -hmm. You can tell in the final film that CGI was employed for some of the skyscrapers, cars, trains, um, Fagin's scooter, <laughs> yeah. uh, and the subway chase with Sykes' car and all that. Yeah. Now, one of our favorite parts of production is the sound and sound design. Yeah. So as far as sound on Oliver and Company goes, Mr. J.A.C. Redford... Um, sometimes he's credited as Jack, like J-A-C, Jack. Okay. But sometimes it's abbreviated, so I'm not sure which he prefers. But Mr. Redford was the composer. He boasted additional credits, such as the orchestrator for The Great Mouse Detective, Mighty Joe Young, uh, The 2000 Grinch, among many others. Shoot. Wally, Avatar, The Adjustment Bureau, Saving Mr. Banks. Uh, and he was orchestra conductor for The Little Mermaid and score conductor for The Nightmare Before Christmas. Oh, my God. <laughs> Oof. Redford was hired to compose the score because of his previous collaboration with Disney music executive Chris Montan on the television series Saint Elsewhere. Hey. I'm pretty excited about this next piece of information, this next person to celebrate, because yeah. I also do love that about our show. We get to call out and celebrate people that may not have been celebrated in a while or um, may, may not get called out for their craft in other uh, arenas. Mm -hmm. The Foley artist, her name was Sarah Monet Jacobs. Oh. She has nearly 300 credits, including The Color Purple. Whoa. That was one of the earliest ones she'd done. Rain Man, Rover Dangerfield, which comes up strangely often for us. Yeah. Harriet the Spy, a very Brady sequel. <laughs> Titanic. Wow. The Rugrats movie. <laughs> Sleepy Hollow. Your Sleepy Hollow. Yeah. Damn. Winning London. <laughs> My Winning London with Mary Kate and Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> Vanilla Sky, Mean Girls, Jeez. my favorite movie of all time, Elizabeth Town, mm. 
the 2015 Goosebumps. No way. And so, so many more. I was absolutely she did shocked for to all see. Those. Yeah, she did Foley for all those. I wow. was shocked to see two of my, like, watch constantly favorite movies on her list of credits being Winning London and Elizabethtown and Titanic, honestly, several others. Big um, deals. Yeah. But her Foley work is impeccable. Hats off to you, Sarah. Thank you for making your magic. I just thought it was so cool that so many of my favorites were her work. No, that's incredible. Um, I'm going to go ahead and mansplain real quick to everybody what Foley is. Oh, yeah. Hit us with the mansplaining. <laughs> um, so actually, for those of you who don't know, um, <laughs> Foley is really all the everyday sounds you hear in movies and TV shows that mm-hmm. you don't know that you're hearing. Mm-hmm. It's footsteps, yes. a car door shutting. It's literally everything. All the sounds that, that you already hear, yeah. but amplified for film. Even made up stuff. If you watch Stranger Things with uh, closed captioning on. Oh, yeah. Squelching. <laughs> I was literally going to say the word squelching. <laughs> squelching noises. It's the ideal, right? It's, it's, <laughs> it's the role in film that's creating something that's so idealistic. Yes. It's what you want that thing to sound like. You're a chef of sounds. You're a chef of noises. And you have to find <laughs> the ingredients that make the thing that you want to taste with your ears. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> so gross. I was about to say, I feel like there there is not a grosser way to describe that. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, this is why you hired me to be your co-host. <laughs> why, yeah, why I hired you. <laughs> this is yet another movie night episode where I must unapologetically screech about how much I love the songs and how they are inextricably tied to my childhood. At least you're not apologizing. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not. This is unapologetic. Unapologetic. Got it. Because this is objectively good shit. (laughs) It is. It is very good. The soundtrack echoes in the minds and hearts of so many people our age, and it actually holds up. And I thought I would just take the time, since this is such a beloved classic, albeit from the dark ages, I should do a little song breakdown. Why should I worry? (laughs) That's all I remember. (laughs) Great existential questions asked to us by the great Dodger. So if you didn't know, it's actually Huey Lewis performing the opening number Once Upon a Time in New York City. Huey Lewis? It's Huey Lewis. And the news? I don't know if the news is with him. I know it's Huey Lewis. Not the newsies. Howard Ashman, rest in peace Howard, is credited with the lyrics for this song. And he would go on to work with Alan Minken and write lyrics for songs in The Little Mermaid, Beating the Beast, and Aladdin. Wow. Legend. This was his first song for Disney after finding success with The Little Shop of Horrors. Oh. And to me, this song is like like sparkly. <laughs> like I don't know how else to describe it. The song is sparkly. It's wistful. It is sparkly. The scene that it's laid over is heartbreaking in so many different ways, but it's also the lyrics are kind of embodying what we were talking about earlier about the spirit of New York. Mm-hmm. That's what's in this song. Yeah. It has that melancholy, but it's also the optimism there's just like an underlying optimism or hope to the song that makes it really pleasant for me to listen to because as you know mm. i like sad shit like i'm i'm the sad girl i like the sad girl music i yeah. i only like the sad things i don't enjoy things that are upbeat and happy typically <laughs> at all i'm also a sad um, girl i get it yeah so it's like a sad 80s version of like the way the uh, old New York kind of jazzy songs. It has a very specific um, sentiment to it that yeah, it does. I love so much. And this song, every time I hear it, my heart is breaking and I'm just so pleased and happy about it. <laughs> yeah. But Why Should I Worry <laughs> is one of the most iconic songs from the soundtrack. And I swear I can't listen to that song without smiling. Um, it's the opposite of most things that we usually talk about. It's the opposite of most things that I usually gravitate toward. But it's a good song. It's a great song. It was nominated for a Golden Globe um, with music and lyrics by Dan Hartman and Charlie Midnight, and it was performed by Billy Joel, Billy who Joel. plays Dodger. I was surprised to see that. I was yeah. like, whoa. That's him. Oh, William. And it was a big reason why the movie was, was technically successful at the time, mm-hmm. uh, in theaters at least. And I also think, when I think of this song... I think that there's an entire generation of kids who can't see a cement truck without thinking of Dodger. <laughs> <laughs> Why should I worry? Yeah. Uh, Streets of Gold is another mood lifter with uh, music by Tom Snow, lyrics by Dean Pitchford. And this song, this also surprised me in my research. Of course, if you were a child in the 80s, I was not born yet. But if you were a child in the 80s, this may not be as surprising to you. Uh, it was performed by Ruth Pointer of the Pointer Sisters, who voiced Rita. Oh, okay. We a singing voice, I should say. Yeah. But yeah, really great. Both mm-hmm. of those songs just immediately bopping. Oh, yeah. I love them. 
they needed that because it was so sad to start with. Exactly. I think that's the thing. I think that they balanced it with this music that I couldn't get enough of. I mean, and kids, kids and, you know, really everyone in the 80s was on the Billy Joel train. So yeah, I think that was the smartest thing they could have done. And one of my all-time favorite Disney songs, Georgette's song, Perfect Isn't Easy, <laughs> yeah. features music and production by me. Barry Manilow. Do you remember when we talked about Barry Manilow's partnership with Bette Midler? Yeah, during okay. During Pocus episode? So he was part of that too. He was. The lyrics are by Jack Feldman, who also did lyrics for The Newsies. Wow, and I just mentioned The Newsies. I know you did. I was like, wait, I'm almost there. <laughs> so he did lyrics Didn't for Newsies. Know. And Bruce Sussman, who wrote the soundtrack for Pretty in Pink. Okay. So all of, like, a lot of greats coming together for that song. Man. And obviously it was performed by Bette Midler, who voiced Georgette. You can totally see them using Bette Midler's mannerisms throughout the sequence, really right. for Georgette as a whole, when she says, clever kitty. Mm -hmm. Like, it's it just it's so Bette Midler. Um, <laughs> I love Bette Midler. Me too. And she was made for this role, just like she was made to play Winifred yep. Sanderson. For sure. I have always loved this song. I remember shouting it. From the rooftops, almost literally, with my roommates from my Disney College program, hey, Courtney. It <laughs> does not surprise me. <laughs> and at Alicia. All. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. God, we loved this song and still do. You singing show tunes? No. Right? Unreal. No. Uncanny. You no. wouldn't expect that from me. And I was just no. going to say, this song, I feel like, is the exact opposite of my entire personality altogether. Like this song, Georgette's personality as a whole, I'm just not that dog. Um, not that bitch, if you will. But I think. <laughs> <laughs> I did not expect that. I think uh. that while this song is the exact opposite of my personality, it must like speak to my Leo son or something. There's just something that connects me to this song. It's and got to. I still, I get it in my head all the time. I sing it very often still to this day. I it's don't an know. empowering tune. Perfect isn't easy, but it's me. And then I'm like apologizing for everything I do left and right. And I dress in all black and I want to be, uh, <laughs> I don't want to be perceived by anyone ever, but well, I'll still sing this song. I mean, who Top really moms. is a bad bitch you unless are. you're just insecure and you need to project <laughs> the bad tree. bitch persona? I mean, I feel like there are some people that deep down, aren't projecting. I feel like there are some people that nah, really embody nah. it. I'm not one of them. It's always a front. It's always a mask. Maybe sometimes. Definitely sometimes. But Smoke's green. Georgette is um, a product of her breeding <laughs> where it's kind of you're well, expected to be perfect you're expected to be the show show dog that's like winning awards and yeah. everything else i think she's given that like that celebrity aspect of like yes. you've been pampered you've been you know put on a pedestal mm -hmm. so now you believe in your own bullshit yeah pretty much because she buys it i think i think oh, she believes it. I think what she, i'm saying yeah. i don't think that she has that um the same insecurity that I and some others may have. But who who better than Bette Midler to play that up, mm -hmm. but in an ironic way? Exactly. She's just so good at that. Like, yeah. I'm all that in a bag of chips. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed it. It was fun. A lot of flair. But yeah, that's it's one of my favorites. I love it a lot. And you can actually see... Um, Almost like visual references to like Cinderella where the birds come and they're helping her dress. And yeah, yeah. We'll get into it in part two. I'm going to have a section that talks about kind of the maturity aspect and Georgette's relationship <laughs> with Tito <laughs> and all that good stuff. So make sure you return when we release uh, part two. There's so much um, there. There's so much maturity and darkness to this, uh, to this movie. So finally... The song Good Company is the song that Jenny sings at the piano with Oliver. Yeah. It makes me want to cry every single time. It features music and lyrics by uh, Ron Rocha. Ron Emphasis Roca. on the Roach. I don't know how to say it. I don't know how to say his name. Rocha. Ron, Ron Rocha. R-O-C-H-A. Um, he was a producer on Beauty and the Beast and Rob Minkoff. Okay. Yes, that Rob Minkoff, who co-directed The Lion King. Wow. Crazy. I saw a lot of Lion King dance moves. Mm -hmm. Lots of animalistic dance moves in the, in the animation. But I was like, that's Lion do, King. Do animals dancing bother you like children dancing until it <laughs> no. bothers you? Just no. curious. And no. we're back. Mm -hmm. No? Okay. Animals are not sentient. We'll keep a, we'll keep a um, running tally. We'll clock it when the <laughs> dancing bothers Christian. Because <laughs> oh. it comes up more often than you would think. it's new to me, too. I'm trying to figure it out. <laughs> I should speak to my therapist about it God. and figure out why. So the song Good Company was produced by the composer J.A.C. Redford, Mr. Redford, and performed by Mayan Tran. Not to be mistaken with Bad Company of Bad Company by Bad Company. Correct. <laughs> Different song. 
<laughs> different song entirely. Not this even is, this is good company. Not even the opposite song. Just a different no, song entirely. Just very different entirely. Mm-hmm. I'm not tired. You're tired. <laughs> That in of itself might betray you a little bit in that you might be a little bit tired. I'm sleepy. I have always loved her voice in this song. Yeah. And I was really sad to see that she hasn't done all that much since Oliver and Company, but she does have a Spotify page. Really? Which is cool. And I'm also reminded of Aristocats again here with the cat at the piano. Oh, man. Tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. We have to cover that. Yes, we do. Shoot. This film was almost considered a test run before Disney would return to a fully committed musical format for their animated films. Personally, I like the music in The Great Mouse Detective also, but it's clear that they didn't put the money into it like they did for this film. Yeah. And for the next decade, all of Walt Disney's animated feature films, starting with The Little Mermaid, were also musicals, only excluding The Rescuers Down Under in 1990. Mm. Personally, this decision to return to the Broadway show tune musical aspect of their animation changed my life. Sure. I'm not exaggerating when I say that at all. Mm -hmm. The early, some of the earliest memories I have are singing Disney songs. Maybe not changed your life, but just like built your life, like defined your life. Defined. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Because who knows what it would have been without that. Because you grew up with it already. Right. Just imagine Disney Renaissance films without the music. Like um, they'd be dark it. as hell. Yeah, they'd just be dark and sad. <laughs> yeah, hard to return to. Mm-hmm. Wow. I think that so much of Disney's success was due to this return to their roots of music in their animation. Yeah, it is interesting that that was a conscious choice. Mm-hmm. I guess they did it pretty early, and then they didn't do it for a while, I guess. Yeah, they kind of backed off of it a little bit. Mm. Something else that I noticed in this film, and you probably did too, was the advertising that's kind of broadcast throughout the film. We see signs for things like Coca-Cola, Kodak, USA Today, Sony, Rider Truck Rental, and more. Oh, I think over 30 companies have advertising in this film. Hmm. I was surprised to learn that while the film was the first animated Disney film to include advertised products from the real world, it was said on ABC's The Wonderful World of Disney that this was for realism and was not paid product placement because it would, quote, not be New York City without advertising. I agree with that. I do too. And I think it did lend to the realism of the film. Huh. And of the setting in New York City. But I was shocked that it wasn't paid. I was like- That is shocking. That's wild that they just did it on principle of this is what New York looks like. We're just going to portray what the reality is. And they didn't have to pay anything just to do that. mm Mm-mm. Not at, to, like, at least not that I saw. Because now brand. you have to clear a brand. I think that it's just a different climate now. I guess that was the 80s, so things were different. That was one of the first things I wrote down. I was like, oh, I wonder how much this costs to get uh, their advertising in a Disney like animated film. And then I learned Yeah, it nothing. really wouldn't feel like New York without yeah, but it. But it wouldn't feel like New York. Like you couldn't imagine Times Square without advertisements. No, that's you all know, it like is. It, it could have just been like rainbow colors and gibberish, but like I think that would have taken away from it. Right. At the end of the day. But it's cool. I appreciate realism. And I kind of liked seeing brands like Kodak that aren't as prominent anymore. Yeah, it's a time capsule. But I, like, it it kind of took me back to that. Yeah, it's it's a time capsule. It took me back to that moment in time when those ads were everywhere. I think it's time to talk about the casting of Oliver and Company. Let's do it. In the official making of featurette from 1988, director George, I cannot say his name right. Director George Scribner, (laughs) I'll get his name right one day, discusses casting the piano man, Billy Joel, for the role of Dodger. And what do you say we team up and change old Louis' mind about sharing some of those hot dogs? He said that his music director suggested Billy Joel, and his primary concern was, I mean, yeah, he can sing, but can he act? Whoa. They did a phone audition with Billy Joel, with the director reading Oliver, and Billy Joel reading Dodger, and the rest is history. Hey, we kind of did a phone audition with Jen. Yeah, we've done phone auditions. We sure have. We've done that. Um, It's kind of fun. And I mean, nowadays, Zoom auditions are the norm. But back then, it was pretty odd to call somebody on the phone and have them audition rather than, you know, bringing them to your studio. Billy Joel, man. He's a big deal. And apparently, he still puts on a great show. Yeah, I've heard that too. I also didn't know this about him, but he was apparently a very successful boxer. (laughs) Not the dog. Like, with, you know fighting and oh, stuff. Oh, what if they'd made him a boxer in the uh, in the movie? That would have been so <laughs> that funny. That would have been kind of funny. But so I also funny. understand why Dodger was a Jack Russell Terrier because like scrappier. Jack somehow. Russell Terrier. The underdog, but also just because Jack Russell Terriers. 
But yeah, he won 22 of his 24 fights and he moved on to music after he broke his nose in his 24th fight. Wow. Weird. Yeah. <laughs> Oliver and Company remains the only film in which Billy Joel has acted as a character other than himself. Interesting. So just this one time he did it. He's like, I I can't improve upon perfection. I won't do it again. <laughs> and I respect it that. It ain't easy being perfect, but it's me. <laughs> perfect isn't easy, um, but it's Billy Joel. Were his other <laughs> roles as himself like the Simpsons and South Park and like things like that. Family yeah. Guy. yeah. He would appear as himself <laughs> and obviously like talk shows and stuff. Sure. But yeah. That's funny. Steve Martin and Burt Reynolds were both considered for the role of Dodger. But Burt Reynolds. Um, and as we know, Burt Reynolds ended up voicing Charlie in All Dogs Go to Heaven. Which came first? All Dogs was after this. I forget. I'm going to double check. I think All Dogs was... Like 89. 89. This is my guess. All Dogs was 89, but Oliver and Company was 88. I'm correct. Yes. I just Googled live on the air. Look at you. To confirm that Oliver and Company was released in 1988 and All Dogs was released in 1989. Look at those podcasting chops you got going on. I mean, real podcasting chops would have been remembering that from when I talked about All Dogs for like three hours. Nobody remembers anything. (laughs) They pretend. Nobody. You're right. Nobody does remember anything. That makes me feel better. They Google on the spot. They edit around the Googling <laughs> and they go, mm-hmm, that was 89. We're being vulnerable, listener. We're being vulnerable. Realism. Oliver was voiced by Joey Lawrence of later Blossom fame. Whoa. <laughs> I, I, I saw him come down. Hey, that's, hey, that's him oh, over there. This is the first time one of the Lawrence brothers were in a Disney project. He would later serve uh, as the voice of Chad in a Goofy movie, which... I have that in my head. Wow. Very I love the Goofy movie. Me too. And if you were a DCOM kid, Disney Channel original movie, for those who don't know, <laughs> you remember him from Horse Sense in 1999 and Jumping Ship in 2001 with his youngest brother, Andrew. These are all lost on me. Sad. Missed, there are listeners that things. are angry about that because those are two great Disney Channel original movies. And honestly, hmm. because I was a child of the early 90s, that was one of my earlier introductions to the Lawrence Brothers as a Lawrence Brothers institution. <laughs> but we also know that um, we also know that Matthew Lawrence was famous for his stint on Boy Meets World and several other. And then they were all on on Brotherly Love together. So the Lawrence Brothers became synonymous with the '90s and pop culture. I guess it sounds familiar, but I'm not like. Oh my god! Immediately, all the girls are like, this. "No, no, the Lawrence Brothers. You know them." I don't know. So. Oliver was voiced by a young Joey Lawrence, obviously, in 1988. Word. Additional characters include uh, no stranger to our show, Dom DeLuise, mm. voicing Fagin. Yeah. Sykes will be here any minute. Uh, and I don't have his... Rest in peace, Dom. Dom DeLuise had already had several roles in several other animated films by this point, mostly those by Don Bluth, like Itchy from All Dogs Go to Heaven. Mm-hmm. We've talked about him and his career for a long time uh, in that episode as well. Oh, itchy. But this was the only time that he got a chance to voice a character in a Disney film. Really? And in true Dom DeLuise fashion, he loved the role so much that he ad-libbed a lot of his lines. Nice. He reportedly chose to be in Oliver and Company over Don Bluth's The Land Before Time that was releasing on the same day. Whoa. What was he going to play? I don't know. I didn't actually huh. see that in any of my research. Like what role he was offered but obviously he was close with don bluth so Mm -hmm. i'm sure he would have had his pick that's a crazy can you imagine if he had been a voice of one of the dinosaurs yeah that'd been good be great it would have been it would have been very don bluth i mean Mm -hmm. dom de louise was a staple there but i'm glad that he got to be part of this movie as well i'm glad that he got to leave his mark on disney animation too right i mean i feel like if i had my choice between something else and doing a disney something i'd probably yeah, you want to do the Disney thing, you right? You want to do Disney, yeah. Next we have Cheech Marin of Cheech and Chong fame yeah. as Tito the Chihuahua. Hey, Frankie, man, what you watching, man? Hey, does he get the girl? I mean, what happened? This was his first full-length animated feature film, though he would go on to voice Stump in Fern Gully, mm-hmm. uh, Bonsai the Hyena in The Lion King, and Ramon in the Cars franchise. Wow. The Chevy Impala lowrider. I didn't know that. I also didn't realize they were in Lion King. Oh, yeah. For sure. Bonsai. Yeah. I, yeah. He's Bonsai's voice a thousand percent. I'm just so intimately very familiar with The Lion King. We did the play in high school. Right. Probably not legally. <laughs> but I just feel like I know every word and every actor so well. Yeah. So when I think of him, that's one of the first things I, I go to. It makes sense. He was also the corrections officer in Coco in 2017. 
Oh. So his Disney legacy has lasted a really long time. Yeah, it's always been around. He was also encouraged to ad-lib lines for his role, and he claimed that only 75% of his speaking lines were part of the film script. Wow. Which I can see that. That's fun. But I also find him to be the most quotable character. (laughs) Yeah, there were some moments. I I quote Tito in my daily life so often. One of my favorite lines is, uh, Hey man, if this is torture, (laughs) chain me to the wall. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. Fun fact, Cheech was also the first champion of Celebrity Jeopardy. What? (laughs) Yeah, he's real smart. He's real smart too. He's on top of it. Um, I also have a soft spot for Cheech, not only because of Spy Kids, Mm. that whole franchise, uh, but because he was on Nash Bridges, which I remember watching whenever I would stay the night at my mom's house, my my dad's mom. Never heard of it. She loved Nash Bridges, which it was like a cop drama at the time. Okay. Um, And I probably shouldn't have been watching it as a six-year-old, but I sat on the couch with my mom and Mm. we watched Nash Bridges. Wow. (laughs) So I always think of that when I hear him speak as well. Einstein, the Great Dane, was voiced by Richard Mulligan. Yeah. I love a story with food in it. Um, he was featured on an episode of The Angry Beavers and an episode of Hey Arnold. Whoa. In season five. How about that? Francis, the Shakespearean bulldog, was voiced by <laughs> Roscoe Lee Brown, who also voiced Mr. Arrow from Treasure Planet. Wow. My name is Francis. Francis. Sir Patrick Stewart was originally considered for the role of Francis, but he yeah. was busy with Star Trek. <laughs> oh, that would have been great. I mentioned Rita a little bit earlier. She was voiced by, um, her speaking voice was done by Cheryl Lee Ralph, who recently won an Emmy for Best Supporting Actress in Abbott Elementary. Fagan's not going to be too happy about this. So Francis, you got the food, right? But Rita's singing voice was done by Ruth Pointer of the Pointer Sisters, which is so wild to me. Like, talk about famous musicians being in this movie. There were just so many, which is so cool. Yeah. And I also have to shout out Rita's blue eyeshadow, just <laughs> as a character choice, because it was the trending, just 100% the trend at the time. Yeah, I guess it was. Um, Rita yeah. wears it. Georgette wears it, too. And right. I love that that's how they signify that these women characters are, you know, in the culture at the time. They They're trendy. Blue eyeshadow. They know what's up because they wear blue eyeshadow. Yeah. I think that's cool. Roscoe, who is the red collar Doberman, was voiced by Taryn Black, who had a few TV credits and a lot of them as detectives or on detective shows, which is funny. Yeah. You know, Rita, I can't figure out why you'd rather hang around a dump like this when you could be living uptown with a class act like myself. Sadly, he passed away last year. So hmm. sorry about so that. So recent. Taren so many people family. just recently. So recently. Yeah. Uh, DeSoto, the blue-collar Doberman, was voiced by Carl Weintraub. Hey, Roscoe. Look what I found. I like cats. I like to eat them. And he had a long list of 80s TV credits. Hmm. So they both were active, you know, in the 80s on TV. And I, as a kid, always thought that Roscoe and DeSoto were such good villain names. They suited these Doberman characters so, so well. They did. Uh, Those are both street names in the San Fernando Valley near the Disney Studios. Oh, okay. That's really funny. (laughs) Roscoe and DeSoto. Well, they're such good dog (laughs) names, too. They are good dog names, yeah. Man, the visual of those red and blue collars Mm -hmm. on those Dobermans was just... Cemented. It's like I was a kid again watching this movie. Those dogs were so scary, but I also, I loved the way they talked. I love their voices. Mm-hmm. That was my, like, one of my earlier moments of loving the villain characters. So and they good. were so perfectly cast and they, you just understood immediately what was going on. Right. Based on their attitude, their voice, everything. Very well cast. Yeah. And speaking of, Sykes was voiced by Robert Legia. Hope I'm pronouncing that right. Who has an entertainment career spanning all the way back to the early 50s, including The Magical World of Disney, Alfred Hitchcock Presents, uh, Gunsmoke. I'm just naming off some random ones. Yeah, no, that's Um, amazing. A starring role in a show called T-H-E Cat. Okay. Several video games like Grand Theft Auto 3, Scarface, and Big. Wow. I don't think you grasp the severity of the situation. Something that I think you'll especially appreciate after our last uh, episode of the podcast, he played the role of Dr. Bill Raymond, who was the psychologist that was advocating for Norman's release in Psycho 2. Okay. Really? <laughs> Robert Lagia. Interesting. Interesting. Lagia. Lagia. Sorry, Robert. I wish I could pronounce your name properly. Robert Lego. <laughs> Bobby Legos. <laughs> the role was actually offered to Marlon Brando. By Michael Eisner. Huh. But Marlon believed that the film would fail, so he turned it down. <laughs> 
So jokes on you, Marlon. You didn't get to be in a Disney movie. Yeah. And I think Robert did an amazing job as Sykes anyway. I liked him. 100% convincing. Hmm. Jenny was voiced by Natalie Gregory, who also had a few 80s TV credits to her name. Don't worry, kitty. I'll take care of you. And I always really liked her voice a lot. It just suited the character. Again, it mm-hmm. felt very childlike and nice. Yeah. And um, I just hope you're doing well out there, Natalie, wherever you are. Yeah. Didn't have a whole lot more information on her, though. Reach out. Let us know how you're doing. <laughs> Winston the Butler was voiced by William Glover, who appeared in episodes of Punky Brewster, Over My Dead Body, and even The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Yeah, wow. So okay. he was kind of around in that time frame as well. Yeah. Georgette is not going to like this. And I also have to add that the legendary Frank Welker provided additional voices, such as that of the hot dog stand guy that Dodger and uh, Oliver steal from he was in so the first few scenes. familiar, his voice. His voice was so familiar because he's Frank Welker and he's done everything, mm. just everything. This man has done so much, but we know him and we talked about him because he was the voice of horror from the Page Master. Well, there you go. And we've already kind of covered it, but I have to mention I would be remiss if I didn't. Last but never least, Miss Bette Midler uh, voiced Ooh. Georgette. Aren't you a clever kitty? And do you have any idea whose home this is? Mm. And we did a dive into her career in our Hocus Pocus series as well. Just God bless you, Bette Midler. What would we do without Bette Midler? I don't know I what I would know. do. She's just a gem mm-hmm. among rubble. <laughs> <laughs> so as with so many of our movie night episodes, that production history and casting discussion is going to wrap up part one. Yeah, it is. Of our conversation on the film. Wow. Because there's always so much to talk about. Yes. And we do before very we much even hope, get to the movie. Exactly. We hope that you'll come back and join us for part two when we talk about all of the pretty darkness within mm. Oliver and Company. We're going to talk about the mob. We're going to talk about the social commentary that Dickens was making a little bit more. Nice. We're, there's just a lot to be said about Oliver and Company. Can't not A wait. two-parter, guys. Thanks for giving us all that super, super sweet information. Absolutely. Because it is important. That's like a main aspect of our show, too. Is yeah, just we have to know where it came from. The people who made it. Yeah, why it was made. Or else it's kind of lost. Yeah, exactly. It was a revelation to me that the kids making this class of Disney animation were raised on crime dramas. And that's like a main... Like that by itself. That's like a point that was made. Yeah. That's why I understand like organized crime (laughs) is because those guys grew up on the movies and put it in the movies that I grew up on. Yeah. And I'm I'm excited to get into more of that in in part two. And it's just amazing that it lives in these cartoon animated classics like this and all dogs and... Mm -hmm. We just keep getting these healthy uh, doses of like true crime and mob and like organized crime and like mm-hmm. all the stuff that just seeped its way into our entertainment. Because that was the horror of the day, right? Like you didn't want to be on the wrong side of the mob. And yeah, that realistic that's horror. That's the worst thing that could happen mm-hmm. to Fagin. Better believe it. And Charlie. And us. And us. Yeah. I don't tend to spend my time in. Um, Gambling rings. Gambling dens. I do and like stuff. to play poker. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie. No, it's fun. It's fun. I've never bet money on poker. I don't tend to do that either. No, mm-hmm. maybe like pennies at one point. I don't like school. to gamble. I like the money that I have, mm-hmm. and then the money I'm gonna get, I want to earn. No, same. Gambling's never been that appealing to me. It's not something I want to do. I'm too risk averse. Yeah. Maybe because I was raised on. Uh, you were raised scary. to be afraid. <laughs> Media. I was raised to be afraid. <laughs> Weren't we all? And that's why we're all here. In very deed. Well, thanks all you listeners, all you darklings, for tuning we in. We really do appreciate you. Thank you for being here. Join us on socials. Yeah. Email us. That's pretty dark podcast at gmail.com. You can talk to Christian that way. You'll hear from one of us. So we just want to say thank you so much to Kyle B. Man of the hour, Kyle B. Uh, and all the rest of our patrons. We really appreciate you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, you're thank really you. contributing to what we love to do and what you guys seem to enjoy as well. Really every minute of research and uh, time that Christian puts into the edit and really everything that we do that has to do with That's Pretty Dark is because of you guys and we really appreciate the support there as well. And if you yourself want to hear us say your name, you can go to patreon.com slash tpd podcast and you can support us at a five dollar level or really whatever you uh feel like you want to give we appreciate it so so much yeah really any amount is super appreciated but even if the only thing you do is just keep listening with us 
That is enough. Thank you so much. We couldn't appreciate it more. It really means so much to us. Thank you. I feel like for the last couple episodes, I haven't been quite myself, and I am just going through it (laughs) from a mental health perspective. You really are. I'm going through it, but I want to continue to show up and be here for you guys and for Christian, and you know, we really care about what we're doing here, so anytime you care about it too, we really appreciate that. This means a lot to us, and you guys mean a lot to us. And if you're feeling any of those bad vibes um, in the mental health department, just know you're definitely not alone in that. And if you ever need a place to vent or somebody to talk to about that stuff, you can always reach out to us because we both are so, so very familiar with what that does to a person and what that can take away from a person. And yeah, we talk about it even in terms of this podcast, like Christian and I are both human people and sometimes we are on it and able to perform and other times we, we perform. But, you know, even right now I'm dealing with um, a very se- severe endometriosis flare-up. And <laughs> I we, we talk about our physical and mental ailments on the show all the time, but like I think it's really important to represent that and to say, this is all part of us and we're just being ourselves. <laughs> we're just here, we show up however we can, and we try to make it happen. Try to. We do. So if you're going through it, we understand. And if you're not, what's your secret? <laughs> yeah. Hey, reach out too and what tell us what do you what your do to is. feel good? <laughs> Cuz we'd I love just to feel good. try that out a I little bit and it would be wonderful. Good. Yeah. It's a Bo Burnham track that I relate to. But yeah, thanks for being here with us mm. for part 1 of Oliver and Company. Honestly, though. We hope it takes you back in a positive way and you don't return to the the spirals. <laughs> <laughs> the poor kitties in the box. No, the poor kitties. I would take every single one of them. I know, especially if it was raining. I had to get Atlas on my lap when I was watching it today. Me so too. I, I had it. kitties. I had kitties <laughs> on my lap too because I was like, I have saved your lives. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. I did I, save you from my, this. Fate. My cats are both. Uh, they're not. They're not rescues, but they were strays. Mm-hmm. And so they both came into my life at just the perfect timing. Just like Oliver and Jenny. Yeah. Well, go love your animals. Go watch Oliver and Company, and we will. Catch you guys next time for part two. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. It gives you time to watch it. So what's better than that? I'm going to watch it again. And I can't wait. <laughs> I'm going to absorb it. It's going to be good. Bye, y'all. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks for listening to That's Pretty Dark. Written and produced by Christian Baxter Mott and Kaylin Andrews. Our music is composed by Jonathan Simmons. And our art is provided by Paige Garland at Power Girl Illustration. Join the collective nostalgia. And follow us on Facebook and Instagram at That's Pretty Dark Podcast. Share your experiences and let us know what shows, films, or villains still haunt you from childhood at That's Pretty Dark Podcast at gmail.com. Remember, you're never really alone. So, until next time, sweet dreams, everyone. God, we're having a meltdown. meltdown.